Hello, everyone. Um, I am Priya Natarajan. I am the current director of the Frankie Program in Science and the Humanities at Yale, and I'm an astrophysicist. I am absolutely delighted that you are all here for the first convening of the year. So here's wishing everyone a very happy and healthy 2021. I want to mention that it is hard not to celebrate the recent shattering of a glass ceiling that we all witnessed yesterday the swearing in of the first female vice president who is black and South Asian. So I just wanted to start off by saying that despite the pandemic and everything, um, I don't know why this took so long, but we are so delighted and proud to have this happen. First, I would like to recognize and thank um, Richard and Barbara Frankie who are here with us today for their generous support of the Frankie program and many other events and programs at Yale. And uh, we are really happy to have you participate so actively in our programming as well. So I, before I tell you about the exciting talk we have in store today, I wanted to remind you that uh, we are recording this event and therefore all participants must mute their videos. And uh, as for submitting questions, uh, please start uh, sending them as per usual to the chat. And we have a slightly um, altered format today, uh, and I will mention that briefly. So we'll start off with the talk, followed by sort of a brief discussion, um, and then the Q&A. So today's talk, as you all know, is part of the ongoing Mapping as Knowing series that we commenced a couple of years ago. It was of course partly driven by my own personal obsession with mapping and cartography, but it turns out it's a very, very rich intellectual tool. Mapping has been a very intellectual, uh, uh, important intellectual tool to study more than just mapping physical terrain. The history of cartography is of course, as we all know, very deeply tied to the voyages of exploration and colonial conquest. However, these very tools that created those maps of domination can be used today to understand better the legacy of segregation and inequality that they have left behind. Our speaker today is an exemplary artist who has managed just that. Use maps to illuminate geographies of segregation, to raise awareness of how these divisions are deeply rooted in our society, culture, and our daily lives of where, and they inform where we live. Tanika Johnson, our speaker today, is a photographer, social justice artist, and lifelong resident of Chicago's Southside neighborhood of Englewood. She's also co-founder of two community-based organizations, Englewood Arts Collective and Residents Association of Greater Englewood, which seek to reframe the narrative of Southside communities and mobilize people and resources for positive change. Within her artistic practice, Tanika often explores urban segregation and documents the nuance and richness of the Black community, countering pervasive media depictions of Chicago's violence and crime. As a trained photojournalist and a former teaching artist, she's been engaged in building an artistic legacy that has gained enormous recognition in the last four years. In 2017, she was recognized by Chicago Magazine as a Chicagoan of the Year for her photography of Englewood's everyday beauty. Her Englewood-based photography projects from the inside and everyday rituals were exhibited at Rootwork Gallery in Pilsen, the Chicago Cultural Center, the Harold Washington Library Center, and at Loyola University's Museum of Art. Tonika is gonna to be talking to us today about her folded map project, which visually investigates the disparities among Chicago residents who are map twins, living on opposite ends of streets that span the city's racial and economic divides and brings them together to have a conversation with this, um, this project was also exhibited at Luma in 2018. Luma is the Loyola Museum, uh, University's Museum of Art. Now an excerpt of this project is currently on display at the Museum of Contemporary Art as part of the Long Dream exhibition. Since 2018, uh, Tanika has transformed Folded Map into an advocacy and policy influencing tool that invites audiences to open a dialogue and question how we are all socially impacted by racial and institutional conditions that segregate the city. In 2020, she formalized the Folded Map project into a nonprofit organization where she serves as the executive director. 
She has won many, many awards and accolades. I'll just name a few. She was named one of Field Foundation's leaders for a new Chicago and was appointed as a member of the Cultural Advisory Council for the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events by the Chicago City Council. I'm delighted that after our talk, we will have, um, we will follow it up with a brief conversation with our own resident cartographer, Bill Rankin who is a faculty in, um, in the departments of the history of science and medicine, who has worked extensively on various uses of cartography and whose most exciting recent article was titled, and it's very relevant to what, uh, <clears throat> what Tanika will be telling us today. It's titled Race and the Territorial Imaginary, Reckoning with the Demographic Cartography of the United States. Following this, uh, we will open up for a Q&A and, &A. and um, I just wanted to mention uh, and thank um, Ty for bringing Tanika and the Folded Map project to my attention and to Tanika for so graciously agreeing to talk so promptly and we wanted to open the series this year with her. So thank you so much Tanika for um, uh, being here and talking today. Her work really exemplifies this cross section of what the between the sciences and the humanities can do, how the tools from science and technology can be used to under, understand and produce deeper cultural meaning and interrogate our society and its values. So Tanika, without much further ado, here's on to you. Hi, thank you so much for that amazing introduction and welcome. I'm so delighted to be here with you all and excited for you all to view the folded map film that I did create during the pandemic so that I would be able to have an opportunity to engage with others uh, despite not being able to do in-person presentation. So I'm really glad to be here with you all and excited to have the conversation with you after you view the folded map film. Great, thanks very much. So I will go ahead and Tariqa, may I start? Yes. Okay. I'm from Southside Chicago. Inglewood neighborhood. I'm sure the words you've heard to describe Inglewood include black, dangerous, poor, gun violence. However, Inglewood is where I grew up and still live. Before I tell you about Folded Map, I'd like you to think about how you came to live in the neighborhood that you grew up in, or where you live now. What influenced your decision? Who did you talk to? And while you're thinking about that, I'm gonna tell you how I came to live in Inglewood and how I created the Folded Map Project. It all started with my grandmother, Marilyn G. Tenney. She came to Chicago from down south in 1962 on the tail end of the Great Migration. She wanted a better life, to have a professional career. And she achieved it when she came to Chicago and got a job as an administrative assistant at the local social security office, what black folks would call a good government job. For seven years, she saved her money while working at the Social Security office to purchase a beautiful two-flat brick building on 62nd and Loomis in Inglewood, the building that I would grow up in with my mom and my two uncles. My childhood was beautiful, unlike anything people would imagine in Inglewood. I played outside every day. I rode my bike with my friends. I met my first friends in life, one of them named Raymond. Him and I would go to the corner store every day for cookies, pickles, and chips. Even my grandmother's best friend, Miss Patterson, lived right next door. She had the same migration story. Every summer, Miss Patterson would make homemade ice cream and sell it to the kids for 25 cents. It was also on this block 
that I started high school. I started going to Lane Tech High School. And for those that don't know, it's a selective enrollment high school 15 miles north of Inglewood. And it's very diverse with a student body of 4,000 students. But every day, I would have to be at the bus stop by 5.45 a.m. just to make it to school by 8 o'clock. And on that everyday commute, I would look out the window, listen to my Walkman, and notice how my neighborhood was very different from the neighborhood that my high school was in. And this was in 1993, so there was no GPS, no cell phones. If you wanted to go anywhere, you had to know the address. You had to know the street. And so as I was on the train going to school, I would notice that my neighborhood had vacant lots. And the neighborhood that Lane Tech was in didn't have any. My neighborhood had hundreds of storefront churches and there was none in the neighborhood my high school was in. My neighborhood had so many beauty supply stores and I didn't see any up north. And I would always wonder, why is that? And there's also one detail that I paid extra attention to. The streets. I noticed that the streets were named the same in Inglewood and also 15 miles north in the neighborhood that my high school was in. Streets like Ashland, Polina, Walcott, and Western. And even though those streets were named the same, they looked completely different. Ultimately, I want Folded Map to help us heal and get to know each other so that we can tear down the racist walls that divide us. For more information, go to FoldedMapProject.com. This is Tonika Johnson for the Folded Map Project. Okay, Tonika, that was brilliant. And um, I think um, we can see that the point that you are trying to make is extremely powerful about how we deal with systemic racism is not by theorizing about it, but really uh, look deeper into our own personal lives and lived experience. And with something as simple as, ostensibly simple as what you've shown us, just addresses that are twinned, um, see how different um, life experiences are and the history of how that came to be. I'm sure the city of New Haven would be a place that, you know, it would be fabulous to um, have your project come to. So I wanted to share um, the, um, the link that um, you can all, um, Tanika, do you want to tell us what people can download from um, the website? Yes. Um, so, and Priya, you'll share the link? Yeah, I just Okay, said. perfect. So the link that Priya is sharing with you is a link to um, the latest expansion of Folded Map, which is the Folded Map Action Kit. Um, the contact list for Folded Map over the past three years has grown to include 800 people who all wanted to meet their map twins. And since I knew I wasn't going to be able to actually facilitate all of those meetings, um, it, it allowed me to create a way for people to have their own self-guided experience as close as possible to kind of walking through the shoes of a resident in their map twin neighborhood. And so the action kit includes information about the project as well as the participants neighborhood. So you can see the statistical difference um, from economics, education, business corridor, housing, 
And then it also invites you to describe your own neighborhood, to answer the questions of folded map, and then to actually go run errands in your map twin neighborhoods. So the, the errands um, is an invitation, one, to go visit another neighborhood, but also an opportunity to kind of disrupt the stereotypes that have been, you know, embedded in, in Chicagoans' heads of other neighborhoods. So in order to do that, um, I figured that just go run errands in another neighborhood you'll really be able to not only meet people in that neighborhood or who are doing the exact same thing, basic thing that we all do, um, but you'll also be able to understand how different it is and what disparity looks like, how convenient it is or how inconvenient that it is. So in addition to instructing people to do these errands, um, I'm also inviting them to share back their experience in the Folded Map Action Kick workbook, um, which is a very simple workbook. We just want you to share what you thought. How was the experience? Um, and you can upload that on to Folded Map's website. So we have the link that Priya sent where you can fill out and get a beautiful hard copy that was designed by my fellow artist, graphic designer friend from Inglewood. Um, and you can receive it in the mail. Or, you know, if you have enough ink in your printer, you can go to the website and print it out yourself. So it's it's up to you. But that that is the uh, one of the latest expansions of Folded Map. Thank you so much, Tanika. That sounds really, really exciting. And uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if every city and every town in the country did this? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, after creating the Folded Map Action Kit, um, you know, a few people who I know from other states, other cities, you know, of course, mostly Midwestern cities, since we are like the legacy segregation cities, they wanted to adapt it to their city. And so right now I'm working with my Folded Map partner, Dr. Maria Creason, to create Find Your Fold. Um, we're just trying to raise money to actually create this other uh, action kit that will be hopefully available for free for other people who want to do folded map in their own city. We want people to understand that, you know, Chicago has a unique grid map that affords us the opportunity to compare in a very unique way, but every place that has segregation has a divide and that divide is your fold. And so if you can just get people from those different sides to have a conversation, um, then you can do fold, folded map in your own city. So I'm currently working on that right now. Great, that sounds fab. So uh, I'm delighted um, to have uh, Bill on now. Uh, Bill, are you on? Is your, could you turn your video on please? Okay. Hello everyone, Thank so, so Tanika, this is fantastic. Uh, so great to see this. Um, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share um, this here. Um, so this is the map that I made about ten years ago. Um, that obviously um, you've you've uh, you've seen. Um, and I I, I want to start just by uh, answering the questions that you posed to all of us. How did I come to live in the place that I live? So in the late 1960s, my dad lived at 7800 South Saginaw, mm. uh, which is uh, down here on the map. And then in 1970, he, he, had, he was his own folded map twin and moved up to the northern suburbs, which is where mm -hmm. I was born. Mm -hmm. um, and the stories that I hear from him about when that, why that happened was, you know, he, the neighborhood was changing. Um, the south side was, was, uh, was, was mixed when he moved there in the 60s and was becoming much less mixed. Obviously, it's now not mixed at all. Um, and he wanted to have a you know, he wanted to have a home that would um, he could grow, you know, could stay in forever, have kids, etc. Um, and that that was sort of that's my story of Chicago. Um, and then the where this map came from, I thought also was kind of speaking to some of what you're you're talking about. Um, I actually I heard from a school teacher in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, he had done a project with some of his um, I think seventh graders uh, trying to understand Chicago. Um, and the way he had done that is to try to make some maps, um, trying to understand exactly the things you were talking about. Where are their stores? Where are their jobs? How long does it take for people to get to work? Mm -hmm. um, so they had found all these statistics, uh, some from the census, some from the city, 
about the kinds of things you're talking about. And they'd made a bunch of maps of them. Mm -hmm. And the one map that just wasn't working uh, was the map of race. They just couldn't make a map that they could really make much sense of. Mm -hmm. um, and all the maps that they um, had been making, all the maps that I had seen myself, looked like this one in the, the bottom left, where you shaded every, every neighborhood a solid color. Um, and it certainly showed you uh, places like the South Side and the West Side, uh, but it didn't really give you a sense of how stark the segregation really was. Yeah. Um, and so the map that you see here the, with all the little dots um, is what, uh, what I came up with um, in my conversations with this uh, middle school teacher as a way to getting, getting kids in the suburbs to understand just how stark the divisions were uh, and just how, um, yeah, just how removed their own lives were from the vast majority of people that live um, in the city. Um, and it's just, it's really great for me to see you making use of the same map in your project. Uh, I'm so it, happy you made the map because I was searching for, I was like, oh my gosh, does this exist? And lo and behold, I found your map. <laughs> it's great. No, and I actually, I've been, it's been, uh, I, what I love about the map actually is how many people I hear from, from Chicago. Mm. Um, so it's not just people who are interested in, you know, mapping uh, in general, uh, but people in Chicago in particular. And, and people want me to talk to people in schools. They want, you know, they want to put this in some exhibition somewhere. Um, and it's about doing work on the city of Chicago, exactly. Um, and so the other Bill, thing- you and um, I definitely have to uh, link up and partner. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. Um, and then there's this map that I actually made um, when I moved to New Haven. Um, and it was a way of just trying to understand what was going on in the place that I was going to be living in. Um, and how did I come to live in the way place I live? I live, you know, in this uh, mostly but not all pink um, area right around here in East Rock. Um, and a lot of it was, um, it was actually not so much um, talking to people and getting nudged by realtors and that kind of stuff. It was, you know, looking up where the restaurants were, where the cafes were, um, where was, uh, where, where, where could I live close to work and, and walk and, and, right. and those uh, kinds of things. Yeah, I think um, and, for me, um, I live in the same neighborhood. And for me, the main criterion was, can I walk to work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, can I walk to a cafe? The cafe. Can I, um, can I, and I used uh, like Thai food. Can I find Thai food? I really like Thai food. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was those, those questions that led me to, uh, to really confront the segregation uh, in New Haven, because the kinds of things that I thought were important in my life were the things that existed in the predominantly white neighborhoods mm -hmm. um, instead of the other neighborhoods. Wow. Mostly, you know, saying thank you, Tanika, for that project. Really great. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, I'm 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 really glad to be able to to share that far and wide now. Yeah, no, this is amazing. And I definitely uh, would love to partner with you on on Find Your Fold, because I definitely would need some maps for other cities that I've gotten requests from. <laughs> so I'll be emailing you. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, and Bill, we would love to have a high resolution copy of your New Haven map. We yeah. would like to frame it and make it available <laughs> to everyone. I'm getting requests on the chat right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to send a link in the chat. Actually, I saw that too. It's on my website. It's already up um, in, okay, in I think, full resolution. And um, good quality, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So let me just, I'll send the, the link real, real, real quick. Oh, I think Kara uh, already shared it. Oh, okay, great. Good. <laughs> great, great. So um, yeah, sorry, um, Tonika, thanks to the pandemic, we couldn't uh, actually host you in person, but now there are plenty of reasons for you. You've already seen the map, so I hope you're going to be enticed to come when you are able. Yes, I would love to, and especially since um, my work with Folded Map has informed my current project that I'm working on that'll probably be within the still working on within the next year. But of course, you know, when you talk about segregation and people and migration, you eventually landed real estate. And you eventually landed all of the issues that we talk about with home ownership. And so um, my current project is focusing on um, making more public in an interactive way, the history of land sale contracts and how they played a significant role in the current economic state of Greater Inglewood. Um, and it kind of all started with, with the question of when was Greater Inglewood's home ownership rate 
ever higher because it's currently like 23%. And trying to find the answer to that question um, as well as meeting amazing people doing a wonderful research um, led me to the information about land sale contracts specifically in Greater Inglewood. So that is what um, my next project will be focusing on. My goal is to make landmarkers for the homes that are still existing in Greater Inglewood that was sold on land sale contracts. And of course, most of them are um, vacant or demolished. So it's a direct connection to that kind of discriminatory uh, uh, practice. And I'm and sharing another map here. Um, this is, I did this for a local uh, newspaper, um, New Haven Independent a number of years ago. Um, and there was a local nonprofit here who had a, a bunch of really good data about foreclosures in New Haven. Um, mm -hmm. And we were we did this uh, this map to to kind of push back against some of the narratives um, happening with the foreclosure crisis that were highlighting and centering the stories of of white middle class families, um, and of course their stories were were, were serious and and uh, for sure. But the vast majority of of actual foreclosures were happening in in um, in communities of color, mm -hmm. um, and so it's I I completely agree that the. The, the maps of segregation and um, racial segregation, the maps of, of housing inequality are the same map. Yeah, and you know, it, it really became clear to me how maps are such a powerful tool um, in demonstrating so many layers of disparity, which is why um, I partnered with uh, UIC's uh, GIS department to create um, an interactive mapping tool on Folded Maps website where you can layer the school the schools that are quality, the businesses that are different on the north and south sides, um, because it it becomes even more clear when you start to add those specific layers. So I really appreciate the map you made about the foreclosures because they, a lot of people don't know how they disproportionately affect um, black neighborhoods. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, there are lots of questions that are coming in on the chat. So Ty, did you wanna? Sure, thank you so much. So compliment first, superb project. And the question, uh, Deepji's curious, what sort of divides you might find in the suburbs? Oh, wow. Yeah, I actually, want to expand the project to include map twins from the suburbs because there's so many ways to kind of do that kind of map twinning because streets that are in Chicago do exist in the northern suburbs that are predominantly white but even if I was just to compare the northern suburbs to the southern suburbs you would see the same kind of disparities um, the southern suburbs, uh, they are now turning more predominantly black. They used to be white. And so you're seeing the same kinds of disparities, specifically uh, with the quality of the education um, and the values of the homes. So those are the most noticeable ones. Um, but of course, there are, are many others. Of course, taxes, that's, <laughs> that's, you know, once you peel back all of the other layers, you, you'll see that difference as well. Could you talk a bit more about the taxes and what you found there? Well, I'm still in the process of learning and researching, but there's definitely, um, you know, a, a significant difference. Um, what is most interesting is that with, within the city, you know, they're actually, you know, black neighborhoods, the taxes are lower, but compared to, you know, their homes, it's, it's actually higher given everything that costs more in the neighborhood. So just the cost of living is surprisingly more expensive in the poor neighborhoods. Um, and everything that affects the, the increase of taxes, um, you know, puts people in a position to, to be displaced. And so that's, that's a whole nother project in itself. And, and I'm still reading and learning a lot about what influences and what impacts all of that. 
So feel free to share with me anything you all find, email me because um, I'm definitely diving into that, especially with my land sale contract project. Great. Yes, I know. I know that in New Haven, there um, is a history of overassessment and particularly Latino areas, overassessment of homes, perhaps, you know, it's disturbing to think, but on the premise that the residents there would not have the money to mm -hmm. hire uh, real estate experts and attorneys to, to go and challenge um, yeah. the assessments. So. It's it's so many ways in which it's, you know, kind of discriminatory. Um, yeah. What's happening now, specifically in Chicago, is that a lot of, um, you know, homeowners of color, you know, people are buying, you know, are paying their taxes, ultimately buying their taxes, and they have to not only fight to, you know, recover that, but, you know, they have to stay on top of paying their taxes because people, you know, just predatory. They mm -hmm. wait for people to just be late. And yeah. so, you know, black and brown neighborhoods are subject to that. Yeah. There was a question from one of the participants, uh, perhaps Bill, could you show the Chicago map again? There might be a question forthcoming. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And then in the meantime, while he's pulling that up, uh, what artists, activists do you admire? Oh my gosh. So many. Um, I have... <laughs> Like their names escape me um, right now. I, I want to. Um, I can't remember her name, but the artist who did the edits of the New York Times articles, Alexandria. I think it's Bell, and she we pasted them across the city, showing the difference between how um, stories that have black subjects. Uh, are covered and worded very differently than stories that have white subjects, specifically um, crime related stories. And she did the edits and the rewrites and showed how and blocked out certain words so that people could see very, very much like fold and map the actual difference in how um, these subjects were described. And so she's one that I have been following and, and in amazement for a couple of years. Um, there is an artist in New Orleans. Her name is Shauna. Um, I can't, Shauna Griffin. She has a project called Displaced and it focuses on utilizing maps, but showing the economic centers of uh, New Orleans and how they are connected to where slaves were sold. And so that was fascinating to me to see the direct correlation between the financial centers in New Orleans and how it connects to um, the, the, the history of slavery and selling slaves and how those exact locations became the financial uh, districts of New Orleans. So that's an amazing project that I have been, you know, nerding out about for a long time now and using as inspiration. Um, but I have to think about the other ones because so many names come to mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question though. There was a request to see the map again here. I'm just going to share it um, briefly, um, but I'll stop sharing so you can see Tanika again. <laughs> Amazing. So um, Bill, I had a question about that map. Was all that data publicly available to you or did, was it a bit of a... Oh yeah, it's all public. Um, so the census data uh, you can get from the web. Um, at the time I, I got it from the the Census Bureau website, which is pretty clunky. Now it's much easier, the National Historical GIS, um, NHGIS, I'll put this in the, 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 the chat as well, nhgis.org. Um, now, so it's really easy to get census data. Um, and then I got a bunch of data um, from the city of Chicago as well, um, about parks and cemeteries and those kinds of things. And then the real work of the map was, was just really figuring out where people didn't live. Because mm -hmm. um, if you just plot all the data in kind of big buckets, the dots spread out everywhere. Um, but once you start figuring out where people aren't li don't live, where the industrial districts are and the, the shipping and the cemeteries and those kinds of things, then you really start to see the, the, the real separations between the neighborhood really pop, pop into place. Um, but yeah, no, it's all the data is uh, free and uh, out on the web. Um, and I think it really underscored for me how, um, you know, getting a totally different sense of the city isn't necessarily always about better data. It's about taking the data you have and, and doing something really different with it, right. using dots instead of solid colors. 
Right. And uh, I mean, I'm um, reading off the chat. Somebody had a question that inspired me to ask this question. Wouldn't wouldn't it be really revealing to overlay on top of this COVID cases mm. and COVID fatalities, like to layer on? So Tanika, is this something yeah. that you're thinking about right now? Actually, um, very early in the pandemic, I anticipated that that disparity and I transformed my Instagram page into you know from being my personal account to my platform to share all of this information in the pandemic and so I did have Instagram posts um, you know I'm not a cartographer in the sense that I make the maps but that was a dream of mine uh, to overlay because I did have a set of three posts that showed um, Chicago segregation in the 50s, 60s, and then the Chicago school closures that were also different, and then ultimately the Chicago map of the COVID cases. And um, it it's it's very clear, it's very clear and evident the disparity. Um, but I did that probably in May. I showed uh, all three of those maps together so people could see consistently where the um, disinvestment and disparity was really showing or having a negative impact. I'm going to share again, um, this is uh, from a, a page from a PDF made by the, one of the local unions here in New Haven. Um, so you'll see my map of, of foreclosures in the upper left, and then the map of COVID in the lower right. Um, it's the same pattern. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, really amazing. Um, and, uh, and just putting those side by side with the same kinds of graphics, I think makes, it makes that point really, really powerfully. Yeah, the, the map, the, the color map is not mine. Um. Um, and you know, what, what I have also been to, I was just sharing the link to the two artists that I've mentioned in the chat. Um, you know, and what I've been thinking about lately, especially with the, you know, if you will, the reckoning of 2020, the, the fact that uh, people are using, are saying uh, systemic racism, um, are, are talking about segregation and redlining in more public mainstream media. And, and that has like never happened before. Um, you know, I have been encouraging people to understand that you know, listening and really um, recognizing the impact of, of all of these issues on Black lives will afford our country the opportunity to understand how all of the sectors, all of the sectors in our country are impacted by racism and ultimately capitalism, but those go hand in hand. And it's the lives and experiences of black people that can really show that connectivity, how it is in each of those industries and sectors. And so there's there's value beyond, you know, just having a conscience and, you know, valuing black lives. But um, if we are interested in working towards um, a more fair, country, more equitable country, um, you can do that through the recognition and understanding of how all of those things impact Black lives. And I think the visual argument is so much more powerful than even the verbal. Yeah. Um, it is just so stark and so visible Mm -hmm. and compelling, right? There's a way in which it is. Bill, wouldn't you say that is one of the powers, power of maps? Mm -hmm. Oh, he has to get unmuted. I know. Will you, <laughs> you have to wait for that. That's right. That's right. You know, I think, yeah, well, for me, thinking back to the, when I made that, that map for the first time, I think a lot of the, um, especially growing up, the South Side was an idea. It was, it was a nebulous place that I, I didn't even know quite where it was or, or how big it was. Um, and what I found making the map was that it really became much more of a real place. Uh, and I started to see lots of other places too that I'd never heard about. Um, so uh, like you, Tanika, I, I didn't know much about the West side. The South side was the, the, mm -hmm. the sort of the thing that everybody talked about. Um, and then there's also uh, black neighborhoods outside the um, in Cicero. I, I never even knew that there was a black neighborhood in Cicero. Mm -hmm. um, and so maps kind of they make they have a strong visual argument that show the segregation, but they also make it really specific. 
Um, they make it real. They kind of anchor it in actual places um, in a way that I think is, is, is does much more, uh, did much more powerful work for me um, than talking, say, in coded language about the inner city or even the South Side, which is its own kind of coded language uh, in Chicago. Yes, when you talk about geography in Chicago, you're talking about people. <laughs> that's that's, right. that's what it means in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> Further questions. Uh, the first, New Haven was split up by the highways. Is this true in Chicago? Yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. You know, just to answer directly without, you know, tracing back the history. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So it's very deliberate is the point because highways were planned. Mm hmm are very planned. I mean, I think that's uh, worth noting, the intentionality behind. Thank you. Uh, second question uh, from Professor Wexler. I think it's really important too, she says that there is a generational aspect to this film. How are you thinking of showing the history on the map? Oh, interesting. Um, well, I'm first and foremost starting with the personal. Um, because in order for the history to even become valuable, people have to understand the present day impact and that you can do intergenerationally, you know, and starting with that, then the connection to the history can be made. So I am actually in the process of creating curricular resources or using Folded Map as a curricular resources for teachers um, in social science, in, in, in art, where people, where the students can examine their own environment first and then use that as an entree into being connected to the historical forces decisions that have influenced their present day life. So, so that is the, the route I'm taking in developing the folded map curriculum. And those are the ways in which teachers and educators have been using it to help their students understand, understand the history of segregation. I hope that that's it for the questions in the chat, Priya. Did you have anything else? So, um, no, I was just um, uh, going to um, to ask um, um, Tanika what um, what really uh, as a was it photography that first got you as you talked about in the film that you wanted to sort of you understood what your trip to your school was about in terms of the change in the landscape. But I was curious about how you got to photography as a medium, as an artist. Oh, yes. And I'll answer that. I just saw uh, Laura's clarification to her question pop up. She was she was talking about interfamily, like interpersonal uh, within the family. Um, so in regards to folded map and connecting it to family history, that's also a part of um, using it as a curricular resource, having students ask their parents, ask their uh, their grandparents the very same question that I pose to everyone. How did you come to live either in the neighborhood or in the city? So uh, teachers have definitely made that an assignment for students to ask their parents how and how, how did they come to live in this neighborhood? And then to also ask their grandparents. So um, interviewing techniques have definitely been applied. Um, but Priya, to go to your question, how I got introduced to photography, um, you know, really my family, specifically my maternal side um, and my grandmother as well, she's an artist. And my mom is a writer, a poet. My uncles that I grew up with, they're also visual artists. So art was just valued so much in my home. Um, I often joke with people that it was valued so much that um, when I decided that I was interested in music, my grandmother and my mom like bought me a piano. So, <laughs> and I didn't even stick with piano for, for that long, maybe like five, six years, but I had a piano. Um, so they really valued um, art. And so when my mom and my dad uh, were, were married and, and we were living together, uh, my father 
had a fascination for cameras. Uh, he never evolved into being a professional photographer, but I grew up around a camera in my face so much that it, you know, sparked a curiosity in me very early on to, to use it. So by the time I was in eighth grade, I was already kind of fascinated with, with cameras and then taking pictures. So that's how it evolved. Anyway, um, that sounds fabulous. So before I say thank you, I just wanted to check in that uh, Richard and Barbara Frankie are old residents of Chicago. So Barbara, oh. do you have um, any particular question? And Guy, could you unmute Barbara, please? Yeah, I'm trying to unmute her now. There we go. Yes. Uh, I'm very curious, it's fascinating to me. Uh, but I'm also very curious, there is an exodus from the black community to return to the South. Do you think some of the questions that you have used, Tanika, um, for your project would also relate to those who are leaving? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because, you know, as a, you know, 41 year old black lifetime resident of Chicago, I definitely uh, can refer to the exoduses of, you know, um, black Chicago. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, I definitely remember uh, my age group talking about moving to Atlanta. It was a huge exodus of uh, Black Chicagoans my age at that time, moving to Atlanta, um, then Texas, um, Austin, now, you know, North Carolina. And it mostly dealt with, you know, not only just home ownership or the lack of housing stock in Black neighborhoods and how overpriced um, houses were in other neighborhoods that, in, that, you know, ultimately are predominantly white in Chicago, but the lack of amenities and resources and how difficult it is to live close to where you probably will be working and all of those decisions to um, all of those elements as well as the continuation of schools and black neighborhoods being closed and going down in quality as a result of you know the population loss um, all of that together made it bleak for you know, young black families in Chicago, which added up to them seeking opportunity, you know, in that reverse migration down south. You know, they can take their Chicago salaries, their education, and just have a better quality of life and get a larger home in some of those southern cities and states. And it's still kind of happening now. Yeah. Are there um, any other questions? If not, um, let's all give uh, Tanika a big round of applause, virtual applause. Thank you all so much. Yeah, and thank you so much, Tanika, for a fantastic talk and what a brilliant project. Yeah, oh, thank thanks you. for taking the time to share with us. No and problem. look forward to seeing you in person. And oh, yes, definitely. And until then, feel free if you all are on Instagram. I live there. So follow me. It's Tonika J. Um, I share a lot of the information that I come across on social media, um, as well as, you know, emailing me through Folded Map, the website, if you have questions or, or requests, and also to download the Action Kit if you'd like or sign up to receive a hard copy. Thank you so much, Bill, as well, for uh, being part of uh, this wonderful uh, event today. Yes, thank Thanks. you so much, Bill. Yeah, I'm glad I could be here. This is great. I'm going to email you. So, uh, I'll okay. <laughs> so email you back. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Uh, so I just want to close uh, and remind you all of two upcoming events. One is an event that we are co-sponsoring. And that is with uh, Yale Quantum Institute. It's uh, a reading by Ben Okri who's a Nigerian British um, uh, a writer who has written a wonderful set of short stories that I heard him um, read in London a couple, oh no, it seems like many years ago now, uh, on quantum mechanics. So it's, I uh, invite you to that. And then our um, next uh, talk in the Distinguished Speaker Series is our very own Mark uh, Brackett will be speaking on uh, February 18th. So we'll send you all information and the poster. Still then, 
uh, stay well and uh, bye everyone. And thanks once again, Tanika, Bill, and Tami for helping with this. Yeah.